History as it happens, June 16, 2022. The fate of Res Publica. Let's have trial by combat. It was domestic enemies of the Constitution who stormed the Capitol. And aware of the rioters' chance to hang Mike Pence, the president responded with this sentiment, quote, maybe our supporters have the right idea. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. The January 6 hearings in Congress are refocusing attention on a dark day, on Donald Trump's deceitful campaign to overturn an election he lost, our bitter partisan divisions, competing conspiracy theories and culture wars are tearing the country apart, evoking the tumult of the 1790s. Yes, the 1790s. The Republic, Res Publica, survived that decade, but will it survive our current madness? Joseph Ellis says it may not, and he's next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. We lost our lives. We lost our lives. What to me is difficult to explain is why a person who is so obviously mentally, morally, and emotionally impaired human being has such an incredible following. It's become cliche to say American democracy is in danger, but that doesn't mean it's untrue. As the January 6 hearings are reminding us, Donald Trump and his supporters, using lies, fraud, and violence, tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power. A precedent that had stood for 220 years, even as our democracy had faced its most difficult tests. You will hear testimony that, quote, the president did not really want to put anything out calling off the riot or asking his supporters to leave. And if you expected, if you hoped the Capitol riot would forever discredit Trumpism, well, here we are 18 months later, and Trump remains an influential figure in the Republican Party, likely to run for president again. And polls show about a third of the electorate believe what former Attorney General William Barr called nonsense. Trump's lie that the election was stolen, as Barr told congressional investigators as seen during the televised January 6 hearings. I saw absolutely zero basis for the allegations, but they were made in such a sensational way that they obviously were influencing a lot of people, uh, members of the public, that there was this systemic corruption in the system and that their votes didn't count and that these machines controlled by somebody else were actually determining it, which was complete nonsense. And it was being laid out there. And I told them that it was that it was uh, crazy stuff and they were wasting their time on that. This is not the first time Americans have feared the country coming apart. Actually, the first generation of U.S. leaders were worried about the same thing, and for some of the same reasons. The 1790s were a time of crazy conspiracy theories. Ordinary citizens as well as educated elites worried about a French invasion and the chaos of the French Revolution. They fretted about something called the Bavarian Illuminati. The news media at that time, newspapers and pamphlets, printed scurrilous attacks on the Adams administration, and the Federalists responded by passing the Sedition Act and throwing Republican printers in jail. As the historian Gordon Wood wrote, every aspect of American life became politicized. People resorted to violence on the street and in state houses. And the leaders of the emerging political parties accused each other of trying to destroy the meaning of the revolution and the Constitution. Yet the Republic, res publica, the public interest, survived. So, as I said, it's now common to hear someone say American democracy is in grave danger. I am more apt to listen when the someone saying it is Joseph Ellis, historian and Pulitzer Prize-winning author of Founding Brothers, among many superb books about the creation of our nation. Joseph Ellis, welcome back, my friend. Hey, it's my pleasure to be back with you. And I just want to say to you and say to our listeners what a joy it was to meet you again and see you at Mount Vernon recently, where you gave a talk about your latest book, 
And I'm sure you enjoyed that too, getting out of the mountains wherever you were up in Vermont to come down to the D.C. area. Yeah, you know, like everybody else during the pandemic, I was in isolation. And and as a teacher, you're used to going into class every day and talking to people. And when that's not happening, a lot of energy builds up. And so it's when the opportunity to address an audience comes, it's really welcome. And sometimes you sort of overdo it. You, you know, you're so pent up. And um, But I enjoy that opportunity. And I enjoy this one as well as a way of trying to talk about the past that does have some bearing on our present situation. Well, maybe it is a difficult connection to make. The 1790s to today and the January 6th riot and now the committee hearings. I did get in touch with you to discuss the 1790s because, as you've told me, you are concerned about the fate of the republic again. I truly am. I do think that the United States is facing a crisis which is, to some extent, unprecedented. And it's very unusual and counterproductive for historians to say that something is unprecedented because our credibility and our influence depends upon us as historians being able to say, well, we've seen this movie before. There are precedents here that should provide us with uh, insights. And yet I do think that the challenge that we're facing now does put democracy as we define it or as the founders would call it, a republic at genuine risk. I think the writing that has been done on this by Timothy Snyder on the dangers of tyranny is really helpful, but it's all based on European experience, on Hitler, on Stalin, precedents which are unique to European history. I do think that that we're facing a situation that is inherently unprecedented. There are patterns here that I would like us to be able to see sure. that allow us to understand what we're facing. To put it very succinctly, that we've never had a president who's a demagogue. We've had demagogues, the most recent of which that some of our listeners can understand is Joseph McCarthy. But they've never gotten to the presidency. And Donald Trump is a demagogue. The issue that's being discussed as we speak before the current meeting of the January 6th committee is to what extent was Trump's behavior criminal? What to me is difficult to explain is why a person who is so obviously mentally, morally and emotionally impaired human being has such an incredible following. So it's not Trump himself. It's the Trump constituency. 30 to 40 percent of the electorate. I think the underlying issue here is race, but I think Trump's presidency is inexplicable without the election of a black man as president. And I think that the deeper pattern here is that we are attempting for the first time to become a biracial society. No such thing exists in the world and it never has existed before. We know demographically that in the year 2045, the United States will become, white population of the United States will become a minority. And that's unacceptable to a certain portion of the white populace. And that's what make America great again means. And it's kind of uh, a nebulous past. Make America great again means let's go back and that In a sense, what's happening is that the full potential of the American Revolution as a revolution is up for grabs. The War for American Independence had a radical revolutionary agenda attached to it. The words that Jefferson used in the Declaration are the most succinct expression. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson didn't believe that African-Americans were included in that. He didn't believe that women should be equal. But that's what the words say. That's what the words say. And when King came to the Lincoln Memorial in August of 63, He said, I've come to collect on a promissory note written by Thomas Jefferson. Ho Chi Minh used those words as well after World War II to claim Vietnamese independence. Not to digress. That's right. We'll stay out of Asia here 
Yeah. The first sentence of the Vietnamese constitution is, we hold these truths to be self-evident. The second paragraph begins, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. So it's an interesting mix of Marx and Jefferson. But I do think there's a pattern here that we're living out. Every major step forward on this, what King called the arc of the moral universe, every step forward generates a backlash. Every time we move forward towards our biracial society, we get a reaction. And we're through the most recent reaction, and Trump is the manifestation of that reaction. How this plays out is still up in the air, to be sure. But my fear is, to the extent that the Trump constituency and the Republican Party and Fox News get their way, what we call democracy will be killed. If you lose democracy, it's like losing virginity. You can't get it back. <laughs> um, I fear we're at that that precipice right now. The positive thing to say is that historical movements that locate the future in the past, who say make America great again or look back, the pattern is they are short-term successes, but they're long-term failures. In the long term, we'll probably be okay, so says history, but right now, living in the moment, it really is up for grabs. So you raised a lot of points there. And by the way, your dog barked at that joke about democracy and virginity. So I guess he or she, dog, a boy or a girl. Well, one. there's two of them, okay. but that was the girl. Yeah. Okay. And he's in another room, but he, he makes noises periodically. Well, Excuse him. Well, maybe she didn't appreciate it then. But anyway, you brought up the issue of demagoguery, Trump being the first demagogue president. Yes. And whether... His presidency was unprecedented and how we have to be careful using that word. Well, what was unprecedented was the fact a sitting president tried to overturn an election, undermine public confidence right. in the outcome of an election. John Adams in 1800, 1801, he did not like the outcome of that election. It was decided in the House of Representatives, but he didn't try to publicly undermine it, did he? He didn't try to foment violence, did he? No, no, just the opposite. If you're looking for a precedent that establishes the kind of precedents being violated now, it's the election of 1800, because that's the first election in which power changes hands from one party to the other. It's not 1796 when Washington leaves office and Adams takes office. It's 1800 when the, the contest is between Jefferson on the Republican side, and they didn't call themselves Democratic Republicans, they just called themselves Republicans, and Adams on the Federalist side. Adams lost the election by four or three or four electoral votes. It was close. But it never occurred to him to question the result. He could have, because Aaron Burr bought the New York legislature and all of the, I believe, Nine electoral votes from New York went to Jefferson. In that sense, it was a rigged election, but it never occurred to Adams to protest that. And that down the road throughout American history, there are a lot of really close elections. And some of them, even then, Richard Nixon could have protested the election in 1960 because Illinois went to Kennedy because the Daily Machine voted to graveyard. 1824. I mean, Andrew Jackson really did win that election. Right. I mean, the, Trump is the first person who has refused to accept the verdict and has mounted a defense of his defeat. I think this is a contemporary position, not dependent on my historical knowledge, but that when the January 6th committee recently said that there was clear evidence that Trump was fundamentally aware of the fact that he was lying. Namely, that he lost the election, that his attorney general told him that, his aides told him that, and that therefore he knows he lost. I don't think that's true. I don't think that Donald Trump can process information that's at odds with his own self-interest. So when Trump makes a promise to a wife when he marries her that I'm going to be faithful, it's meaningless. When he makes a promise to a bank that he's going to pay a loan, that's meaningless. When he takes an oath to the Constitution, it's meaningless because no higher authority other than his own self is relevant for him. So I think he would pass a lie detector test on the notion that he actually won the election. In some sense, if it ever came to a trial and I was his attorney, 
I would advise him to adopt the, the insanity defense, that he cannot tell right from wrong. He's not going to do that. We're at a moment when a person who is in the office of the presidency or was is fundamentally incapable of processing defeat. But what's not explainable is why such a huge percentage of the American electorate and major media outlets continue to endorse this verdict. The underlying issue for the larger populace is because we cannot accept the basic fact that we're becoming a biracial society. And this is a man who stands to prevent that from happening. I think there are other issues in addition to race, though. I think there are issues of class, mm. um, immigration. You're right. There's another issue. The globalization and technology essentially cheapen the value of labor and that people whose grandfathers you know, graduated from high school and they went to work with the local factory, made a very good wage, got good benefits, retired in their late 50s, and they had a good life. That's no longer possible. Status, race, class, but also something that's harder to put your finger on. It's not your typical partisan divide. It's this notion that there is an establishment, there are elite institutions that have failed the country. And Mm -hmm. Trump represents people who are tired of those failures and feel like the establishments, however defined, are institutions Mm -hmm no longer represent them. You brought up Timothy Snyder in your first answer. Mm. He's obviously a great historian, but I do not find many strong parallels between what we're seeing now and the 1930s in Europe. I had Ian Kershaw on the podcast a couple of months ago. Our conclusion was, after I took him on a tour through the 1930s, was the parallels are weak. And maybe there aren't even many strong parallels in our own history because we've never seen a president act this way, trying to overturn an election. But the 1790s are pretty close, Joseph. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I agree with what you said about Snyder in the 30s. Back then in the founding era and playing out in the 1790s is a fundamental argument about what the American Revolution means in terms of government. To some extent, the American Revolution is based on a conspiracy theory that the British government is attempting to enslave us. They aren't attempting to enslave us. They were attempting to revise the British Empire in a way that was more consolidated. Uh, One group of people that will eventually be led by Jefferson and Madison believe that the true meaning of the American Revolution is that any form of government that attempts to impose its will on the populace is dangerous and that government is them, not us. And at that point of view, is the point of view adopted at the end of the revolution in the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation represent a definition of state sovereignty that's exactly the same thing that the Confederacy claims is what it wants in 1860-61. This makes sense to a lot of Americans at the moment because the average American at that time grows up, leads his or her life, and dies within a three-day horse ride. They don't have cell phones. It's difficult for some of the undergraduates that I taught over the years to understand that. Perspectives and horizons were limited and local. And so that any form of government that's far away, that's imposing its will on you, is inherently a tyranny. And Jefferson and Madison make that case in the 1790s against the Federalist government of Washington and Adams. Adams gives them something that they desperately need when he signs the Alien and Sedition Acts. He later says, I didn't really believe in this, and it was forced upon me by other people in the Federalist Party. But that act seems to confirm government is a kind of potential tyrannical force, and uh, the rights of the press are being oppressed, et cetera, et cetera. But that Madison and Jefferson, in, in in the creation of the Republican Party, want to create a party It basically says sovereignty does not reside at the federal level. It resides at the state level. And if you think that that's attractive and there's reason to think that, also realize what that means. There's no way to end slavery. What that means is once the Virginia dynasty takes office and you get Jefferson, uh, then Madison, then Monroe, you got all, all of whom serve eight years at a very time when we need to take action against slavery. It is 
politically impossible to do so because the federal government does not have the power to do that. And if you think that the two tragedies of the founding of the failure to take decisive action against slavery and the failure to avoid Indian removal, and that's true, those are the two great tragedies. The possibility of doing that is no longer present in the political culture once you've got a state's right definition of federal power. I also want to talk about conspiratorial thinking. Again, to your initial answer, you laid out a lot there, so I'm going to keep going back and pick at it a little bit here. Okay. Another divider today is not just the issues we discussed, whatever they may be. And there is a debate right now as to just how divided Americans are. Maybe it's exaggerated. But we do have people living in alternative universes, living in different worlds Mm. from each other, depending on maybe which cable network they're watching. Mm -hmm. And conspiratorial thinking is certainly not new. I was consulting Gordon Wood's book, The Empire of Liberty, or Empire of Liberty, and he's talking about the 1790s, which is what I invited you on to discuss, and we'll get to that. John Adams, the president, calls for a day of fasting and prayer, May 9th, 1798. At this point, there are concerns that France is going to invade the United States, and we're going to get to that as well. And in this paragraph, Gordon Wood writes about how uh, this day of fasting and prayer appealed to certain members of the clergy. Jedediah Morse, who is the author of a best-selling book called American Geography and a congregational minister in Massachusetts, spread the theory that the French Revolution was part of an international conspiracy to destroy Christianity and all civil government. Drawing on an anti-Jacobin work of the Scot John Robeson, Morse traced this conspiracy back to a central European society of freethinkers called the Bavarian Illuminati, who had infiltrated Masonic organizations in Europe. Morse claimed the French were now conspiring to use the Jeffersonian Republicans to subvert America's government and religion. Wood goes on to say, preposterous as these conspiratorial notions may seem, at the time they were believed by a large number of distinguished and learned American clergymen. He says conspiratorial notions were often the only means by which enlightened people in the 18th century could explain a concatenation of complicated events. I like the use of the word concatenation there. But what's changed? <laughs> <We're> still... <laughs> right. And both sides believe in conspiracy theories, not just the right. Conspiracy theories are effective in democracies. Democracies are very vulnerable. The founders knew this, and it's one of the reasons why the word democracy and I know your close friend, Sean Valence, doesn't like this, <laughs> but, but the democracy was an epithet. You accused somebody of being a Democrat. You said democracy was mob rule. Democracy was delusional commitment to emotional issues. The founders went back to the historians like Thucydides, Tacitus, and Cicero to talk about the way in which the Roman and the Greek republics were threatened by demagogues. And democratic societies are vulnerable to demagogues because they play on emotions. And emotions are something that ordinary Americans who are not well-read, not well-educated, are vulnerable to. So you know, this story of conspiracy theories, and you can see them on the left and on the right, is an inherent part of, of American society. Where Gordon and I part company a bit, and he and I are close friends and and work together on many projects. Two New Englanders. Yeah, we are. He's from Providence and I'm from Amherst. What he calls empire of liberty is a commitment to prevent the expansion of slavery into all the territories and the confiscation of that empire by white settlers at the expense of the indigenous population. And you can say that those two things are, with especially the latter, is inevitable. Um, once the Americans win the revolution and gain the territory of, as far as the Mississippi River, it's difficult to imagine how you're going to stop these people from going across the Alleghenies to pursue their own happiness in the form of land. But the, the way in which the triumphs and the tragedies of the revolutionary era and the founding are interacting all the time is a crucial message here. And anybody that sides on one or the other without noticing that there's a conflict here is, is missing the point. So anyway, 
in terms of the issues that resonate for us today, the vulnerability of the current population to conspiracy theories is as old as American history. It's absolutely to be expected. The degree to which that now will mean all elections in America will end up being questioned. And that if you put a person into the presidency who is committed to a point of view that we would call authoritarian, the ball game's over. And we can see how it will play because it's what Trump tried to do. Get your attorney general to define the law in ways that support you. Get people at the state level to invalidate votes that don't accord with their their preferred verdict. Once that's in place, you can look at a place like Putin's Russia. You can't get it back or that it's, it's extremely difficult to recover from that. And I'm afraid that we're at the point when it's possible to imagine that that's what's going to happen. And you can see that we might see that in the 2022 or in the 2024 elections. And things are being arranged now for that to happen. We're at an inflection point. Elections Um, are decided at the state level and state level officials can control the counting of votes and any number of other things. Elections for secretary of state at the state level. At the state level, that's right. There are people running for office who believe the 2020 election was stolen, so they're going to fix it. And they're running on that principle. That's right. I I think that, do they really believe that? I don't know, but I know that they believe their own political future depends upon it because the base of the Republican Party is the Trump base. If you somehow were able to bring the founders back to this moment, and of course that's not possible, often attempting to cite the founders in contemporary policy is like trying to plant cut flowers. (laughs) They're living in another world. But I feel confident to say that if you brought Madison back and you let him see, he said, why do you have the Electoral College? I thought it was stupid. I thought we were forced into it. And and when I walked out of Philadelphia, I wrote Jefferson. I told him this is a mistake. The rest of the world thinks it's some sort of crazy. I mean, nobody understands it. And yet there's no way to end it. No portion of the Constitution has been criticized more than the Electoral College. Yeah, I want to bring that up with you right now, actually. Sorry to interject, Joseph, but to your initial point about demagogues, one idea behind the Electoral College was that the people cannot be trusted to avoid demagoguery and therefore they can't directly elect their presidents, the Electoral College will serve as an intermediary body. Obviously, it doesn't work that way anymore. You're right. If you look at Federalist 68, written by Hamilton, He says one of the reasons that he likes the Electoral College, he's defending it, is because it separates the final decision of the presidency from the people to a select group of people who will be more informed, more enlightened. Well, of course, now it means it's vulnerable to people who have a a political agenda. The ultimate irony is that a demagogue got elected because the popular vote doesn't elect the president. Right. But that's one of the reasons you're never going to change the Electoral College, because no Republican candidate can win a a national office if you do away with the Electoral College. No Republican candidate for president in the 21st century has won a majority of the popular vote. I'm in favor of doing away with the Electoral College and have been quoted as that. But I'm also a historian to tell you it's almost impossible to achieve that. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. So the 1790s. Except for the era of the Civil War, writes Gordon Wood, the last several years of the 18th century were the most politically contentious in U.S. history. I think most people don't quite realize just how crazy that decade was. And why don't we start in 1796? That seems like the right place to start because Washington is retiring. It would be the first real presidential election. The young country's leaders aren't quite sure how this first election's going to go. No one really anticipated how ugly politics were going to be. Why did the ugliness catch them off guard? Because they didn't foresee the creation of political parties. And they believed that the commitment to the cause during the revolution and the commitment to the American Republic was a view that all shared. But they were more clear about what they were against than what they were for. Jefferson himself was on record as saying, if I must go to heaven in a political party, I prefer not to go at all. But he, along with Madison, creates the first opposition party. Yes. 
and, and while and, Jefferson is the vice president, too, to undermine his boss, so to speak. He does. And Dumas Malone, who was the great biographer, five-volume biography of Jefferson, says, you know, during the 1790s, I don't understand Jefferson. He's behaving in ways quite uncharacteristic. I mean, my God, a guy who spent 40 years trying to understand Jefferson says that during this very, very crucial moment, he doesn't understand what he's doing. The reason he doesn't understand it is because Jefferson is being guilty of the most duplicitous things imaginable. He's sitting in the cabinet while attempting to undermine the authority of Washington. He's spreading the word that Washington is senile, that Washington is not really running the government. Hamilton is. And none of that's true. Jefferson and then Madison together launch a campaign to undermine the authority of the Washington administration and the Federalist Party. Their version of Fox News is a magazine called Aurora. And the Aurora is edited by Benjamin Franklin Bache, who is Franklin's grandson. And one of the first things it publishes is a report that they have new evidence that throughout the American Revolutionary War, Washington was secretly a traitor. He had been bribed by the British and that what in effect Benedict Arnold beat him to the punch here. And what they were releasing was documents that the British government releases during the war to try to undermine Washington's authority. They were you know, fictitious documents. The argument that Washington was a traitor, it was just ridiculous. That's a conspiracy but, theory. All right. Conspiracy theory in the zenith. So that you're right that uh, someone who thinks of the founding as this quiet, consolidating period and you hit the 1790s, and it's like, all of a sudden, it's like static. It's like craziness. It's like things are out of control. And that's because, in the end, I'm saying, while the cause during the revolution, everybody agreed about the cause, and the cause was independence. And independence meant freedom from British tyranny. But what else did it mean? Those are unanswered questions. And remember, remember, no nation-sized republic had ever existed before in world history. This is an unprecedented thing. Power did not flow from God to monarchs or dictators. Power flowed upward from the people to their elected representatives. And they're very aware of how vulnerable the republic is. Washington's farewell address is about this and a, and a warning that we've got to try to stick together here uh, in order to avoid falling apart and in order to disintegration. Republics die in their infancy. So the Federalists fear the Republicans. Republicans fear the Federalists. What I mean by that is they simply didn't oppose each other. Each view the other as an existential threat to the Constitution, to the meaning of the revolution. You know, as you were explaining, the revolution wasn't just an event or an endpoint. It was the start of a process that is still unfolding. And what strikes me about the 1790s, Joseph Ellis, the extent to which events in Europe shaped American politics. Talking mm. about the French Revolution right. and the fear of what the French Revolution, a contagion that might affect the United States. Why were people so concerned about the French Revolution? Because eventually Federalists view the Republicans as the conveyors of this disease. They're going to undermine right. the country. In part because they believe that the French Revolution represents an application in Europe and France of the values of the American Revolution. Jefferson believes that. The Federalists are saying that Washington has a letter he writes to Rochambeau at this time, who's a French commander of French troops during the Yorktown and Rochambeau is at the time on the verge of being sent to the guillotine, which he avoids. He said in France, when they have hot soup, they tend to gulp it down and they burn their throats. We in the United States like to blow on the soup and to sip it slowly. And what he's saying is that there is a radical agenda to the American Revolution. And the secret of the success of the American Revolution is that it's deferred. That is to say, the full implications of equality for women, for African-Americans, etc., is put into the future. And the French are attempting to do all of it at once. And uh, that's going to be a catastrophe. Nobody's more aware of that than Adams. Our role is to sustain a republic based on a set of principles that do have egalitarian implications, but they cannot be implemented now. 
the French were also directly or actively interfering with domestic politics. The, the French are essentially in, uh, making war against the American trade and scooping up American ships throughout the Caribbean during this time. There's a thing called the quasi war with France going on. France is attempting to flex its muscle. The French Revolution is still in the process. We don't yet have Napoleon in charge. But he's fighting battles in Europe. He's not in charge, but he is. France is conquering Europe. He hasn't become the dictator yet. And the United States is committed to a position of neutrality. But how can you be neutral if one of the European powers is making war on you? And so there's enormous pressure to go to war with France. And remember, France is the country that has saved our bacon. We could not have won the American Revolution, at least on the time frame that we did, without the French, the French army and the French navy. But now France is behaving in ways that make them an enemy. If Adams as president had declared that we were going to go to war with France, he would, without question, have been reelected in 1800. The right thing to do politically was to go to war with France. It's the last thing that Adams was going to do. And you can say, well, how could he do that if his political future was going to be as president ended? Adams thought that way. Adams was a contrarian. Adams felt comfortable when what he did was unpopular. He said, whenever I do something that doesn't have a popular majority, I know I must be right. And in this particular case, the public interest is different from the popular interest. That's the difference between a republic and a democracy. Res publica, things of the public. And if that means losing the next election, so be it. So at this time, the Republicans are more pro-French, and they actually want the French to invade and defeat Britain. The Federalists, as we've been discussing, are more pro-British. But these divided loyalties, if you will, they come to mirror the way Americans start to describe their own society as well during the 1790s, where you have a contest between lowercase d Democrats and aristocrats. Gordon Wood would agree with that. Yes, I'm getting it from Gordon Wood. Yeah, that's he would say that. It's a democracy versus aristocracy kind of thing. That's what I call the Neo-Beardian view of the revolution. And Sean Lentz, also a person you respect a lot, and I do too, would tend to go along with that. I'm a bit of an outlier on that, and that the issue isn't democracy versus aristocracy. The issue is, are we a nation or are we a confederation? Are we a single government that oversees all of the the states, or are we a series of states? And the underlying reason that the latter position is popular among Jeffersonians is because it preserves slavery. But it has a noble heritage behind it and in opposition to any kind of tyrannical power. The Federalist position, as Adams understood, and you're right, Adams is a kind of incompetent president. He's never exercised executive authority in anything. But his whole cabinet is Hamiltonian. They hated him. They hate him. They hate him. He's a man without a party. Which, of course, he says, great, that's exactly what I want (laughs) to be. And among the founders, by the way, Because of his papers, Adams' reputation has grown over the last 20 or 30 years. Even uh, Gordon agrees with this because he tells you exactly what he's thinking in a way that very few of the other founders do. And he's more self-revealed. But but the truth of the matter is that the conflict between Republicans and Federalists at this time is intellectually unresolvable. They have a different view of where the country needs to go. And the direction that Adams wants is going to not be the direction that, say, Andrew Jackson wants. I think that the word democracy is a term that in our modern 20th and 21st century parlance, we always think if it's more democratic, it's better. I don't agree with that. I think that the word populism might be better used here. But the populist tradition in American history is invariably racist. So the Federalists, you're right, they didn't really get lowercase d democracy. It's why they had 
nowhere near the number of politicized newspapers the Republicans did that appealed to the middling sorts and that ferociously attacked Adams and the other Federalists. But it's really remarkable the extent to which people believe France was going to invade the United States. I don't think France... uh, Adams said, you know, it would be as if you told him that there was this ice in the middle of Philadelphia that didn't melt in the middle of the summer. The the whole notion of a French invasion was a conspiracy theory. Yeah, but there's violence in the country at this time. Republicans and Federalists are brawling in public. Adams finds himself with, on his one side, the high Federalists, the Hamiltonians, who want all-out war with France. They want to expand the size of the army. The Republicans saying, no army, no army at all, because that just makes war more inevitable. Adams Mm -hmm. tries to weave a middle ground here, a middle way, where he declares this quasi-war, but he's really uncomfortable with the whole thing, and he sees the country tearing itself apart. Right. I agree. And the French send this minister, Edmund Genet, over, and Genet is, goes around the country telling people not to obey the, the decisions of, the, of Washington and the, or the Adams administration, encouraging treason, et cetera, et cetera. Even Jefferson says, we have to disown this guy. It's scatological. It's an explosive, highly passionate moment. And the essential underside of democracy and of a Republican government and the degree to which it is going to become, it is inherently volatile, becomes clear in the 1790s. The kind of settled, controlled world that Washington wants to have happen. But another way to put it is once you remove Washington from the political equation, things start to fall apart. Washington's the singular figure who can be trusted with power because he's an aficionado of giving it up. And once you remove him, and Jefferson says this, once Washington leaves office, we're going to succeed. He's the only thing holding the Federalists together. Adams eventually manages a soft landing and he defuses the situation, but at great cost to himself and his party, we need to talk about the Alien and Sedition Acts, really the Sedition Act, because even some Republicans supported the Alien mm-hmm. Act. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to also note the context in which the Sedition Act was passed. I mentioned the newspapers before. I mean, this is very relatable. The role of the media in Mm. an emerging democracy, (laughs) founded Mm -hmm. as a republic but becoming more democratic, where people are reading newspapers all over the country. You know, regular folks are forming opinions about their betters. The United States has the highest literacy rate of any nation in the world. In England, you know, only about 20 percent of people can read and write. In New England, it's 95 percent. In the South, it's slightly less, and it's greater for men than women. But the, Those good the, New England schools. Those are New England schools, and the proliferation of newspapers. The pamphlet is the early version of what's the proper term now, the, what your program the blog is. or a podcast. Blog, <laughs> yes. early blogs, yeah. yeah. But yeah. The and point then, I wanted to make, Joseph, and have you respond to it is these attacks really were scurrilous against right. Adams. And I think that's why with a potential war coming, you know, even in peacetime, I think it was Abigail Adams who said, we can't wait for the war to crack down. (laughs) We need to crack down on these seditious opinions now. What's your view on on how this unfolded and why the Sedition Acts were such a bad mistake? The Sedition Acts were a mistake. The high federalists under Hamilton were the ones that wanted to do it. And yet you're right. There was one New Jersey newspaper called uh, weekly called The Wasp. And in it, they accused Adams of, of having all kinds of problems and mentally crazy. And also he had a big ass. He has a big ass. And <laughs> Abigail says, how do they know you have a big ass? Only I know you have a big ass. If you look at Abigail's advice to her husband, John, over the years, she's almost always right. Here she's wrong. She gets it wrong, too. She says, go after him. The Sedition Act you know, is unfair and ridiculous and da 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 So one occasion when Abigail's advice to him is misguided. On the other hand, it is, if you're looking back from our perspective, you're right to pick this late 1790s this time. Boy, it's really familiar. You know, the same kind of widespread misunderstanding is fundamental to the political process. What Gordon might call the aristocracy, I would say it's a natural aristocracy. It's not a European feudal-based aristocracy. American aristocracy was weak. Yeah, there's no such thing. 
the Federalists do support Britain because 85 percent of trade is with Britain. And so there is a kind of, quote, a quasi capitalistic reason for their, their position on this. But it is kind of weird for the Jefferson Republicans to say they're the ones in favor of the common man. Most of them are, are slave owners. Yes. Yeah, there is that contradiction there, running there is through this. There is there. So that the American Revolution is designed to produce a natural aristocracy. In order to be a member of that, that group, you have to have played a central role in the winning of independence and its immediate aftermath. You have to have credentials as a person who took the right position in that crucial moment. And a lot of people didn't do that, so they're off. Once that's passed, then you find out that you don't really agree about many basic things. Yeah. We know what we're against together, but we don't know what we're for. We don't know what it means to be an American. I skipped over the X, Y, Z affair. That's okay. We don't need to get into that now. I will just encourage our listeners to look that one up. It adds fuel to the fire. It makes the Republicans look, well, close to treasonous because the French are so badly manipulating American politics and the Republicans have been defending the French. So the decade where the Republic seemed like it was on the, on the brink of coming apart does end with Jefferson's election in a contested election. And then 24 years of Republican rule and relative calm, at least compared to the decade before. How did that happen? How did we escape the 1790s with our country barely intact? Well, you elect in Jefferson a, a Virginian um, who's succeeded by two more Virginians. If and also the it, Federalists were discredited to some degree as the well. Federalists are discredited. The Jeffersonians are better at local politics and better at organizing at the local level. Even in places that are supposedly Federalist bastions in New England, it's calm. But remember what I was trying to say earlier. The election of the Virginia dynasty is the death now for any resolution of the slavery question. It's the death now for any attempt to resolve the Native American problem with any degree of justice. But Joseph, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is after this crazy decade, conspiracy Mm -hmm. theories are flying around, people are beating each other up in the street over the French Revolution. How did relative calm return? It didn't if you were a Native American. Um, It didn't if you were a slave. It came because we've decided the federal government is not going to address those controversial issues. It's that the power ultimately resides in the states. Yeah, Jefferson basically pairs down the small federal government into something that's tiny. Right, which is, in his view, exactly what, what the revolution means. And he's got history on his side in that regard. And that when the revolution begins, the commitment to the common cause is a temporary provisional commit, come together to win the war and then go our separate ways. And in that sense... Uh, Jefferson and later the Confederacy have history on their side in the belief that there was never an intention to create a powerful federal government from the start. And it is Washington and Hamilton and Adams and Marshall who say, no, the true meaning of the American Revolution is a nation-sized republic. Lincoln inherits that legacy. And that legacy never wins in court, but wins on the fields of battle in the Civil War. To connect this conversation and wrap up with what's happening today, I don't see that we're coming toward the end of our decade of division, so to speak. That uh, the 1-6 Mm -hmm. committee and the information they're disclosing should once and for all discredit Trumpism, but it won't. I agree. Constituency that believes that Trump won the election or that it was an unfair election, seems to be a cult that is going to remain committed to that view in ways that defy reason. I think because the Republican Party recognizes that the Trump constituency is its base and they cannot repudiate them. And as a historian, you, you tend to be working on the past. And so when you write, you know how it's going to turn out. In the present, we don't know how this is going to turn out. As I said at the beginning of the hour, There's some reason to be optimistic that political movements in America based on a movement backward to the past, make America great again, tend to have limited lifespans and tend to end up losing in the long run. The real danger here is if you cross the line, 
and essentially allow the state governments controlled by Republican legislatures to fix every election, to essentially begin with the assumption that any election that does not go our way, we will be able to discredit. You have crossed the line into an area from which it will be difficult to return. It is the founders' concerns realized, democracy undermining res publica. Joseph Ellis, you are always welcome here. On the next episode of History As It Happens, remember when candidate Biden said this? We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. There's very little social redeeming value in the present uh, government in Saudi Arabia. Well, so much for that. The president will visit Saudi Arabia next month as reality wins out over idealism. Why has the U.S.-Saudi marriage lasted so long? We'll explore that history next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.